Hello and welcome. Today we're going to walk through a recent uh, blog article. This one is called Persistent Storage in WebAssembly Applications. Feel free to go to this URL. I'll leave it in the description below and you know, have a read of the article and there's some code examples so you could pause this video if you wanted to follow along, uh, install Spin and Redis and get a uh, couple of applications up and running with permanent storage. And at the end, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview and some examples of application ideas that you could create using persistent storage. All right, so the first paragraph here is you know, a word about persistent storage and how that's useful. Um, obviously, executing the business logic of an application is one thing, but we also need to store the state of the business you know, in between those transactions or in between that uh, business logic executing. And so WebAssembly, a bit of a um, high-level overview there of that, and just essentially pointing out that by default, WebAssembly doesn't have a storage mechanism. And also, you know, for safety reasons, um, when executing in a sandboxed environment, it doesn't really have by default access to um, the host system. So, you know, um, network sockets and um, file system reading and writing and things like that is out of the box by default. Um, not offered. So we're going to go ahead and provide um, a solution implementing both WebAssembly and persistent storage for you today. So the first thing, if you're following on with carrying out some coding, is we need to install Spin. Now Spin, uh, this is the official documentation over here, it can be installed a couple of different ways. You can go ahead and just get the binary executable for your operating system. And also the way we're doing it in this blog article and also for this demonstration is we're actually going to clone the github repository and then we're going to um, install that in our case we're going to actually use cargo to install it so i'll go ahead and do that and if you want to do it as well just feel free to pause the video and um, join me back at any time that suits so here as mentioned we go ahead and clone the spin repository and once that is on our system we'll go and install that so we cd into the spin directory and then we do this um, set the wasm32 wasi target which should be done already on this machine. I'll do that anyway so you can see. And then here we do a cargo install. And now if we type spin minus minus help We'll see here that we've got the latest version there, 0 0.5 at the minute. All right, so the next thing to do is go ahead and install Redis. There are a bunch of different ways you can install this as well. Um, for example, uh, there's a Mac OS page, and there's a few you can use Brew to install that. Um, we're going to do it again from source here, though, just for presentation purposes. So I'll just cd to the home directory. We'll go ahead and grab this Redis stable Okay, and once we have that, we're going to extract that. And then we cd into Redis stable, and then we go ahead and install that. That's now done, we've installed uh, Redis, and once installed we can go ahead and start Redis using this following command, redis-server. So let's do that, and then let's leave this terminal open and running. We'll head over to a new tab to complete the rest. Okay, so as we can see we get this similar output in our terminal. Now the Redis command line interface is also able uh, to be started. So there's a few examples here. If you're new to Redis, feel free to try these out. Um, if we use the, the Redis command line interface, you'll see here that you can set uh, values and get values, um, you know, increment, uh, increment by. So just feel free to go ahead and try these out. Set num to zero and 
We said get num. It'll show us that. And then we increment num. And then we get num. That will have increased to one. All right, so we'll just leave that console running in there for now, and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So we've got the server running here, we've got a uh, cli running here, and we'll just grab a new tab and keep going. All right, so with the creating a spin application section, what we do is start off with an application template. So to list the templates, you type spin templates list, and that'll list the templates that you have currently on your system. If you would like to install, say you didn't have the templates installed, if you'd like to install them, you can type spin templates install and pass in this um, GitHub repository here, and that'll go ahead and install them. What we're gonna do is create a new application um, using this command here, so spin new Redis Rust. So essentially what we're doing is creating a, an application based on this template here. All right. And once we have that up and running, we're going to edit the uh, on message function in the uh, lib.rs file. And what that does essentially is um, when a message is broadcast on the Redis channel, it'll go ahead and uh, print that to the console. Right, so we've created that application and we're listening there on localhost on port 6379, which is the default, and we're uh, telling that, that we're communicating with uh, a channel called channel one over here. If we look into the uh, source lib.rs file for this, we'll see here that the on message uh, at the moment just has some logging So we go ahead and change that, and we've just got a print line statement in here. So we save that file, and once we've made those changes, we do the cargo build and build the application. And to start it, we do the spin up command. All right, so the spin application is now running. And if we go over and publish a message on channel one over on the um, Redis command line interface, we'll see the results. And we publish, we can see here that there's one listener and that would obviously be our app. And in our application here, we see that's now put um, hello there to the terminal. So each time you publish on the Redis channel, it will actually execute that function and in this case we're just doing a print line to the console. Now uh, if you're curious about how the configuration for this is done, um, the application template already did it for us but let's go and have a look at how you'd set this up um, yourself. So in the applications directory we have a spin.toml file and if we look into that we will see that these have all been pre-filled for us. So the address um, is localhost port 6379 and we see here that the channel has been set to channel 1. So when we created the application we were asked a few questions and, and this has just been auto populated for us for our convenience. Uh, the source of the actual WebAssembly executable is in uh, the target wasn't 32 WASI releases directory and it's called Redis trigger example. So that is actually um, when a message is published on that Redis channel we'll see that this source file, which is compiled to that WebAssembly executable, actually executes each time. So next in this blog article, we looked at the opportunity to create many components. So uh, as we can see in here, we have this single WebAssembly executable here. Well, you could essentially in any application have multiple of those WebAssembly executables. And so, 
if we had a directory structure like this, where we have a, a spin hello HTTP example, and we have multiple directories, and in each of those we have a source file, so we have rock, paper, scissors example in this blog, and each of those um, librs files will obviously compile to a WebAssembly executable and each of those um, will perform a different task. So in this case we're just um, you know echoing rock, paper and scissors back and so this shows you how to set up this configuration on the file system by just copying a few files around and creating some directories. So you can go ahead and follow this uh, verbatim and that will all work. And we've got one that we've prepared earlier so we'll, we might just run that real quick and take a look at how that works. All right. And so probably the most important thing uh, to know would be the configuration in the spin.toml file. So if we have a look, once you've created this, you'll see here that there's multiple components. So we've got a rock, a paper, and a scissors component, and they each have rock.wasm, paper.wasm, and scissors, and also have a unique route. So by visiting forward slash rock you execute the rock file and so on and so forth. Okay so to build each component you run this cargo build command here and to start the application similar to the previous one we just did is we do the spin up command. Okay so this shows the available routes so for rock we have localhost port 3000 forward slash rock and as you can see with paper and scissors we have a similar output there. So if we were to go ahead and visit this in a browser, we would get we would get the response scissors like that. So upon making a request to that endpoint, we are getting a response, and the response is essentially just um, a response with a body of capital S scissors in it, and which is exactly what we're getting. So that's great. So let's go to the next part here. We have the section of persistent storage. So in order to perform this persistent storage, we're going to make a few changes to our original uh, Redis trigger example, the first one we did. Uh, in the blog here, we've handily provided all of the changes uh, that need to go ahead. So feel free to just cut and paste this code uh, out of these code blocks straight into your application, the Redis trigger example. And once you've done that, we'll be able to go ahead and demonstrate the persistent storage. So the changes are primarily to the uh, spin.toml and the cargo.toml file. And then finally, looking at the lib.rs, you can just go ahead and take this entire code block and replace your librs's content with this. And what's happening in here is we're setting up um, Redis address and the Redis channel, and we're also have a function called publish. Now this function does many things all in one. What it does is it takes advantage of the spin SDK um, Redis implementation and you see here that we have Redis get and we're actually able to get a value. Now this will be similar to if you remember back to the command line interface where we're actually doing sets and gets and increments and things like that. So it's fairly straightforward to follow along. Um, the Redis implementation here in the Spin SDK is excellent and allows you to simply type, you know, get, set, um, again, set there, and then also increment. And this last one here is Redis Publish. It actually goes ahead and publishes uh, onto that particular Redis channel at that particular Redis address. And all that happens in this function uh, when that code is run. All right, so we can do a spin build in the top directory, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, that's finished. And then to start it, we do spin up. Okay, so once again here, we've got the available routes, and this Redis trigger example is available on localhost port 3000 at the publish endpoint. So when we go and visit that endpoint, similar to the other examples, we'll see that the code, all of this code in here is actually executed at the moment that we um, send a request to that particular endpoint. All right, so we've visited the publish endpoint. So now that that's running and we've gone to that publish endpoint, 
this function has been executed. And so now we can have a look at, for example, we did a Redis set here, and we set this value of int key. So if we if we take that, we'll see that this value of int key was initially set to the value of zero, and then shortly after the value of int key was then incremented, so we should see a value of one. So let's go ahead and check that. So we'll say, so we type get int key, and as we can see, the value is correctly set to one. Another thing to check here is, as part of this, we have the set command, which set this spin example to the value of Eureka. So now if we go ahead and get that spin example key, we'll see the word Eureka. All right, so let's tweak this a little bit and just to show how it works. So in here, let's go ahead and via the source lib file, go down to here where it says Eureka and let's add in here Eureka, it works and triple exclamation mark. All right, so now we go back to here, we can rebuild that and then run it again. And if we go back to the browser and hit that endpoint, we'll come back to the terminal. And if we go and get that spin example key, you'll see the different output Eureka, it works, triple exclamation mark. Now, one other uh, thing before we wrap up is uh, Redis has the ability to save the entire data store on disk. And what's fantastic about this is the Redis command line interfaces uh, save functionality is done simply by typing the word save. And what this means for your application is if this save is performed, you can shut down your entire operating system like a full reboot, come back up again, and when you return, all of these values will persist in here. So essentially you've got a fully operational Redis data store with um, publishing, listening, getting and setting values and also the ability to do checkpoint saves and um, complete system reboot and have all of your data persist over time. So this really opens up a lot of different opportunities for creating WebAssembly applications. I've just got a couple of quick examples I just want to throw around, just things that popped to mind whilst writing the article. Um, if you think about the different components, so we have multiple components and essentially these are made up of functions in our case written in Rust, which are then compiled to WebAssembly and they essentially are different little individual microservices. You have examples like this where you could have a stock entering a system and the items at hand will get entered in as they arrive and a listener can be updating the business's ability to essentially package up and ship orders. So on one hand, you've got individual items coming into the stock and then on the opposite end of that you've, you've got orders being packaged up made up of multiple items and as those go out and be and get shipped to customers the adjustments are made to the stock levels and that will immediately calculate the um, shipping again so you have this dynamic way of monitoring all of the company's inventory and every time there's a minute change made it can be recalculated over and over. Uh, for example, like if there's stock adjustments being made, if somebody's adjusting what's available at hand, you know, stock on the floor, um, as soon as those changes happen, that activity can trigger to recalculate the shipping and disclose which orders are, are ready to fill. Another quick example is, and probably just a simpler example of that is, you know, you've got raw ingredients coming in and each time an adjustment's made, uh, the listener can execute some logic, and that essentially, in this case, is recalibrating or recalculating what recipes can be produced out of raw ingredients. And similarly to the last example, uh, if something is produced from those raw ingredients, then they can be minus um, from the stock levels, and as that output ships, the adjustments are made all in real time. And one last idea, which is along similar lines, but has nothing to do with stock or inventory or anything is think about if you have a data store on a client and a data store on a server and they are the same they essentially match you're able to make a small incremental change to the data on the client 
and then send that change up to the server. The server can then update its data store and generate a checksum and then only send back the checksum. Now, the reason you do something like this is um, A, because you can, because WebAssembly is um, isomorphic or universal. And so essentially you can have a, data, a large data store on the client, a large data store on the server, and the client can actually interact with the data store and make changes, incremental changes, but not actually have to send that entire payload back and forth to make those changes. So what happens here is the user makes a small change, updates uh, the data store and generates checksum locally. Now this WebAssembly component here can be exactly the same as this WebAssembly component on the server. So once that small incremental change is sent up to the server, let's say via a request, the server does the same operation, updates the data store, generates the checksum, sends it back, and then the client can just confirm that these match. And this is essentially a way to not need compression anymore. Um, it's a way to do version control across a client server without having to send and receive a payload. So just a few examples of microservices and multiple WebAssembly components and request response and listening and publishing, all these sorts of features that are available now. So any ideas you have for applications, please share them and it'd be great to hear from you. Thanks for watching.